right. So uh, it is time for us to get started at 7.06. Let's give Ashley her moment of quiet and then we'll get to it. But I'm really excited about this week. This is one of my favorite and weirdest non-obvious process weeks. So we've got, this is a fun one to get started with. If you've been wondering, what is the value add of this weird class and the strange person who talks? Uh, this is where I would say we start to see the real moment where it shines. These are things that aren't inherently obvious with the machines downstairs, but that become really cool really fast. All right, so this is week 12 of foundations, and we're gonna continue on with making in three dimensions. And so last week we talked a lot about 3D design and 3D modeling, and I've definitely still got 3D design software up and ready to look at. Like here is Fusion 360. Um, you might have played around with some of this. You might have even 3D printed things if you were really going for it and being productive this week. However, just doing one of those two things is totally reasonable. Um, but getting in and playing around and seeing those sorts of things has was the goal for the week. Here's an example of one of the things that I modeled this week. And then we can go to Octopi and see what's printing downstairs. So you might have also interacted this past week with um, Octopi. This is what, Octopi 7, 2, 2 up there. And so you can see what's going on. Nobody's printing anything right now in Octopi 2. So there's all sorts of cool options for how you can print, what you can do. And over the past week, we've been playing around with those sorts of things. And now we're going to try and take a look at how this fits in with different processes. Like the example that you can see here in this picture is an example of a mousetrap car that some students of mine built a few years back where there's mousetraps to power it, two mousetraps. And then they laser cut the body out of cardboard, which may not feel like it's a very strong material, but like I've said before, and we'll say again, cardboard is secretly amazing. I could stand on that car without a problem, not with the wheels on it. The wheels and axles are a little bit more tender because you're putting all the pressure in one point. But if you can spread it out and have the body without any wheels, that is definitely able to hold up my weight, which is wild. Um, and so you can do really interesting things to save a ton of weight, to, to use interesting materials. These are laser acrylic wheels, a couple of threaded rods and pieces, but you can use 3D modeling to design things that you're gonna make not on a 3D printer, which is really where it starts to become a powerful process. So that said, we're gonna go through a few things. Some of them are totally about G-code and 3D modeling and 3D printing, and some of them wander into weird other places. Uh, like we'll talk about 3D scanning, which is fun. If you've been in the space over the past couple of weeks, you've probably seen the Ductator, which is a scanned and 3D printed sweet potato that's shaped like a duck, which was fantastic. I loved every second of that evolving. Um, and so that was lovely. And then we'll talk about two and a half D design, which is really where it starts to get cool and weird and all sorts of fun things. And you'll get to see a secret software that like, I think Autodesk is trying to kill um, this one right here that will let us do all sorts of fun stuff that's called Slicer for Fusion 360. And so you can find that somewhere hidden deep inside of Autodesk's website, but then you can use it to make cool stuff. Hopefully they don't watch these videos and then try and find, <laughs> find a way to break the link. But um, we'll totally do all this stuff today. So first up, let's talk a little bit more about STLs and G-code. We sort of glossed over it last week. And if you did a badging for the 3D printer, then you probably talked about these a fair amount, STLs and G-code, because the STL is the shape you bring to a slicer like Prusa slicer, and then the G-code is what the machine actually runs. So we saw this graphic, the STLs are all triangles like this. There's also other, increasingly, I tried out for the first time this week, the 3MF file format, and I like it. Uh, there's other file formats instead of STL that also work really nicely. And so I should probably pull up Prusa Slicer and just show what the options are. Um, but with all of these different options for, let's see, open up this. Here's our things. If we go to file and import, it says STL, OBJ, AMF, and 3MF. Those are all different geometry file types that you can bring in from a 3D design software or the internet and use. Interestingly, there's also STL imperial units. Um, basically, Prusas, which are designed and made in the Czech Republic, are 0% imperial, the American system, uh, as are most tech things really at its heart. And even actually the inch is defined by the centimeter, fun fact. <laughs> um, 
But the, the key here is that you've got many options for how you bring in things. But when you do, you're bringing in a geometry. And then you need the slicer to get you from there to G code. And so there's a bunch of options, Cura and Slicer or Prusa Slicer is what I just had open. Those will take you from your 3D model to the G code for the machine. And having a slicer like Prusa Slicer, because we, and since we were last run foundations, all of our printers now basically all the entry level printers are Prusas. I would solidly recommend you download the free software Prusa Slicer and just get comfortable with it. Um, a, a good tip with that is that it will take your geometry and turn it into the actual motions of the machine. You can see here all the lines sort of laid out for where it's going to ooze out plastic. That sort of planning is done in the slicer where it goes from the geometry that your design work is into the, the motions of the printer. And so that's really neat as a process. You can go super deep into this if you really are interested. Um, but the biggest takeaway that I would definitely recommend for somebody who's new, if you've just installed Prusa Slicer, is this print settings thing up here. Jump it over to 0.2 millimeters quality because it runs four to eight times faster than the 0.05 millimeter ultra detail. This is the default option just because it's the top of the list. Um, and it looks really nice when it's done, but it takes a long, long time. I've definitely had things that tell me they're going to take 13 hours to print on ultra detail. Take two and a half hours to print on quality. So making or speed or even draft if you want to make things fast. 3D printers can be for many different purposes, but if you're prototyping or making something quick, um, like if you want to have it as a gift at the end of this week, ultra detail or is probably not the one you want. You probably want to go for the quality or draft. So there's tons of cool options in there. And, and oh. texture, so many of the after application stuff actually has something to grab on. So if you're if you're applying one of those, oh, that's a good point. On material, literally give you a finish. Um, yeah, if you want to, instead of like sanding something to make it rough, you print it in the draft quality, so it's got sort of ridges to grab. But don't. Um, I, I would say that that ultra detail I use super super rarely. <laughs> Um, it's for when you want it to come off the printer and then it's done, you never touch it. That's what it's going to look like for forever. Um, but the, the draft and quality with 0.2 millimeters is really helpful. So in any case, we've maybe run through this process over the course of the week. And over the next basically two weeks, you're going to have time to do this if you haven't yet. And I will say that over, especially over the next two weeks, you're going to need to message the person you want to come in and badge with if you haven't yet badged on the 3D printer. Because if there's ever a time of year where someone says, I'm going to skip out on my facilitator hours, this is probably the time of year. So definitely reach out to people. Um, and so make sure that you can get that if you wanted to come in and do it. If you just want to spend, spend the time 3D modeling, you can totally do that. And by the time we get to the, later on in today's talk, you might want to 3D model and then laser cut, which you already have a badge for, which is totally a fun way to make things. So... If we wanted to just dive a little deeper into what is an STL, it is triangles and that's it. So like here's a triangular globe with all of, all of the countries sort of drawn out as blocky shapes or this crystal shape is just a, as few triangles as you can imagine. Anything that looks like a square just takes two triangles to make. And then smooth-ish curves can be made with just an array of a bunch of triangles. So STLs are just the triangular shapes. If you played Super Mario or Smash Brothers 64, those like polygon characters, this is, those are the polygons that we're talking about. Um, so this is just a little bit of geometry information so that you can have shapes. And basically the higher the detail you export, the more triangles for curved surfaces you get. Um, and a software like Mesh Mixer will let you sort of edit those triangles. And I think Fusion has an option too. And I think many of them do, they're all, artsy i'm gonna say they're not they're less of an engineering science and more of a like creative artsy interpretation which can be great for some people and it's just not where my headspace is um but i've got a friend at smith college who loves doing it and so what he does for work so like it's a really cool process if you want to play with mesh mixer to edit triangles you can totally do it and then g-code g-code is sort of an ethereal thing when you haven't looked at it um other than to click the button and then upload to octoprint but g-code in general is a programming language that's Turing complete that was first around in the 50s, which is kind of wild. Um, it's a programming language where you can pro you program in logic, but basically all we use it for 
is to move tool heads like this one back and forth across the things that we want to make. This is a previewer. So NC, uh, NC view or NC, yeah, I think it's called NC viewer. NC viewer online will let you view your G code sort of in a, in a space. So if you want to look at what it looks like, independent of the machine, it just runs through the positional information. But you can see that basically your G code is just a list of different positions where it's telling the nozzle, move here, move here, move here, do this thing, ooze out this much plastic, move at this speed. And it sort of calculates all that out and just sends it a whole bunch of positions to go from here to here to here to here to here. It is the most tedious uh, color dot, dot coloring, connect the dots puzzle ever is basically what G code is. Um, but it's a common thread for lots of machines that we're gonna see. So the, the only notable exceptions are probably the two that we've done, the vinyl cutter and the laser cutter. They don't really talk about G-Code at all, but the 3D printers, the water jet, the CNC machines, all of those, they all run on G-Code in the same way that, that's been there since the 50s. And this is used across the board. It's used in at-home 3D printers, and you may never need to actually see the G-Code all the way up to machinists who like know to some level how to read and write G-Code in a practical way. And I, I would say, do not put in effort trying to learn your G-code commands. It's fascinating, uh, but I've, in my lifetime of doing things and I've made a lot of strange things, I've needed G-code commands for three projects total maybe. So it's it's something that you learn when you need to, um, but there's, there's tons of cool options here. So what are some advanced 3D printing tricks, things that you can do? First off, there's Octopi. Um, and this is great. It feels like a big, complicated interface, and it totally is. Um, but the more you learn its little details, the more you can fiddle with it and make things work. And I would say the same is probably true for Prusa Slicer. Once you start to get into this, you can you can look at it a lot closer. And so here I've got a link to Octopi 2, or I've got Octopi 7 pulled up. They do, or 2 pulled up, and they do look a little bit different. So there's some different details to this, but this is just a web server that is running on a Raspberry Pi that's sitting next to, I don't know if that's where my, my cursor's in the right spot. Uh, but this is just running a web server on a Raspberry Pi right next to the printer. And so in here, you've got all sorts of different options. Like here's the terminal. You can send actual G-code commands to this if you feel like it. And so you can, you can directly control what's going on with the machine. If I go to Octopi 3, which is a, it's not a 3D printer, it's a weird, um, sand CNC that we made downstairs. In here, you can send it specific codes and commands. Like if I say G28X, this is one of the projects that I have learned some G code commands for. G28 is home and X is home the X dimension. So somewhere downstairs, it's homing the X dimension of that particular machine. And so this is super rare that you would now need to do that. Um, but if you're interested, it is a fascinating process. But learning how to play with Octopi is fun and helpful if you want to really get into the nitty gritty of 3D printing. So it's a cool way to, to do some of that. Also, a big thing that's good to learn is how to 3D print without supports. And so there's a bunch of different options of how you can 3D print. And I think this might play with audio, so I'm going to mute it as we go. Um, but you can 3D print with all kinds of different supports. And so there's different categories. Like this is a video of how to make custom supports in Mesh Mixer, where supports on something like this Anubis head are going to take up a lot of print time and then they've got a weird effect that they leave on things. So you don't necessarily wanna have them, uh, and, but you can support it exactly where it needs it. So there's some interesting things that happen like that. Uh, I've also heard that Prusa Slicer 12, the most up-to-date Prusa Slicer, has a really interesting, it might be 12, maybe it's, I'm not sure, um, but it's got a really interesting feature where it'll do this internally to the design. So instead of having zero infill, you can have infill supports. So it will infill almost none at all, but only where it needs it, which is a really fascinating process. Um, down here, if you're designing things, you can design in certain features like overhangs are going to go fine if they're sort of slowly stepped, but if they get to bigger stepped areas over 45 degrees, you're going to need a lot of um, a lot of supports, or you can just design it so that it doesn't need to have supports. An interesting one is like this little car that looks kind of like a bulldozer because it's a cabin, you know, the main part of the car you sit in is at 45 degrees. It doesn't need any supports throughout there, which is really fascinating. 
Um, and then this hinge is probably, if you look, this is sort of like a long, slow taper. So this is not ever a big overhang until you get right up to the end where probably it won't be much of a issue because it's a short gap. Um, but this is gonna be a print in place sort of thing. And probably with the right tolerances, you can even have it printed with wheels and axles and hubs all interlocked at one spot. So when you pop that off the bed, the wheels just roll. Um, there's some wild things that you can do for 3D printing that cover the gamut of all sorts of different styles. But this is, this is definitely something that you learn that's very specific to FDM printing. Uh, so the Prusa printers downstairs supports are all, the rules are all different for the, for the form labs and the, the resin printers. So it's different for different cases. The, the place where I think I would think about this the most is if I was printing in the carbon fiber nylon, because that, that filament is expensive and it's very slow. And so anything that you can do to speed it up is helpful. And it's so tough that removing supports is actually problematic that you, you might have to apply so much energy, so much force that you're breaking things. And so you wanna be careful with that. And if you can find a way to avoid printing with supports, you can, you can totally do it. There's a Maker Muse uh, video that I will send on, which is a Australian kid guy who is a YouTuber that talks about 3D printing all the time, has some fantastic points about how to avoid supports in any of your designs. And so let's click on to the next thing. Also, while you're 3D printing, you'll probably have talked about infill and shell. Infill is what goes on inside of your print. And then the shell is if you wanted to just print the outside wall. And so there's this vase mode for some slicers where they take a model like this. This would have just been a solid model. And you can print it in vase mode where you say, this is the top surface that I don't want to have and just turn it into a vase. They can make designing vases much, much easier. Although I will say, if you're going to print in PLA, PLA is usually not watertight. But PETG, which is just about as easy to print with, it's slightly higher temp. Uh, PETG isn't at the start, but you can anneal it in an oven. And so once it's printed and in its form, you pop it into an oven at low temperature for a little while. And all of that plastic will fuse together just a little bit more so that it becomes watertight. And so there's some cool, some cool options there. And if we pop back over to Prusa Slicer, which is here. Then here's generic PETG. They've got sort of these generics. You can get into more specific. Here's like Prusa's own filament or generic PLA, PETG. In here, it's gonna go through all those things. Your infill, you've got different percentage options on the simple. In advanced and expert, you can, you can get more detailed in your um, print settings and sort of what you want your supports and things to look like. So you can definitely nerd out on all these details within your 3D print if you really feel like it. So there's there's lots of good options there. But uh, it's neat to see, and then there should be a little, there's a 3D printed model somewhere down there of like what this looks like in reality. So it's good to look at if you did, if you did the batching, you might've seen it. Um, another thing that's really helpful to think about is how do you modify your designs so that they become stronger or how are they likely to fail? So a lot of the times when you're making things, you wanna think about how is this going to break so that you can design it, design it so that it doesn't. A common one is that if you wanna put a post on something, you might have a, a platform and then a little post sticking up out of it. If you do this, it's really only adhered right at that bottom edge. And so these are almost always tragically weak. So having a post sticking right up out of a 3D print is usually a bad way to go. If you can put a bit of a fillet or chamfer onto the bottom, you get a much stronger bond because you've got a lot more surface area and that sort of fade of transition. You can also think about how thick you want your layers to be. Um, some layers are gonna be really, really, some prints in draft quality are gonna be very thick line layers. And when they're talking about the 0.2 millimeter layer height, this is the thickness that they're talking about. So you can see these layers are, are visible without a macro or, or zoomed in at all. And down here, they're definitely, what I thought were the layer lines were like four layer lines. And so you can get very high detail. Another thing to think about is that if power fluctuates, and this doesn't seem to be a problem, it, this is oddly local. So this is not a problem here that I've noticed. However, when plugging in 3D printers at home on circuits, at different houses, places that I've lived, or at the school where I previously taught, this was a constant problem where like they, the machines would not quite get enough power. And so when they make their sideways steps where the belts are just a little bit loose, they wouldn't quite make it going sideways. 
And so you'd get these weird like wiggly up the sides where everything vertically is going fine. But then all of a sudden it makes a little like half step hiccup. It doesn't quite go back to where it was for printing. And those are called layer shifts. Layer shifts like this are, this is a bad one where like probably it was printing someone like accidentally stuck their finger in there or something and like it didn't go all the way over. They got pinned, I don't know. There's a whole bunch of reasons why these could happen, um, but these are likely fails. And so it's good just to think about that. The other thing that's really important is that if a print's gonna break, it'll probably break along these lamination layers. So if you're trying to hold things together, you may wanna think about how those layers are oriented so that they're, you're not like pulling, you're not doing a shearing strength between the layers, a shearing test between the layers. And that's a, a little bit tricky. You definitely wanna, that's one that I wanna point at lots of things. If you can get the layers to not be rubbing against each other, like not pulling sideways between the layers, that's the most likely way that they'll fail. If you can put in compressive strength, that's usually pretty good. Tension strength is always a little dicier because you're pulling on those layers, but tension across the layers is the worst. A crunch tension along the layers is usually much, much better. And so there's those sorts of things. If you're really getting into the details of 3D printing, you can, you can be in that headspace for what's going to make the strongest prints. Um, and then multi-material high-end printing. We do have a dual extruding printer downstairs and I've never seen it turned on, but I'd love to work with anybody who wants to. Um, it's got two nozzles like this one here and those two nozzles let it print in two colors. So you can get really cool prints like this where you've got a red and an orange or like this tree frog is really cool that it prints it out with black and green all in one shot. Or this is Benchy, the 3D print test with the different colors on it. There's all sorts of cool things that you can do there. Or you can even, you know, thinking sort of about the form labs. This is an older version of the form labs printer, but generally thinking about how that would work. And I'm pretty sure we pulled this up last week, but shape, if you really want to go far out with shapeways, you can order crazy things in all sorts of different materials. Um, and like, look at all these wax casting of gold. If you really want it, um, just be ready to pay through the teeth. Is the, is the short summary of that. Um, but it, it's definitely a cool way to get access to materials that you can't 3D print here. Um, really awesome things to do is also 3D scanning. And so if you have something in the real world that you love and wanna preserve forever, you can 3D scan it. And so here's a 3D scan of my head, which is maybe the, the wrong one to follow that up with, uh, but a 3D scan of my head right there Here's like 3D scanning for characters in video games and movies where they have a bunch of photos taken from all sorts of different angles to get perfect scans of models. Uh, and then this is a photogrammetry of New Haven, right? There's the New Haven green. Google's doing this all the time with their satellite view because all of those photos come in at slightly different angles. And then for major urban areas, they've also you know, chartered flights over to do more photogrammetry data collection. From that, they're able to roughly estimate the height and size and shape of buildings by constructing all those photos together. You have software that goes in and looks for all the edges. You find where edges on each of the photos are and it sort of adds them together in a very methodical, very CPU intensive sort of process, but you can totally make this happen uh, for the entire town, right? And so that's kind of wild that Google is able to do that. It used to be that these effects in Google Maps someone was painstakingly going in and using SketchUp to model those buildings. And so lots of universities had them first because universities had grad students that they could make go do it, right? Um, and then they figured out how to do it automatically from the photo data and you can get this sort of a thing to come out. Now, this is not just like far away land. This is, there's software that you can get on your phone. So Scan3D is a phone app. The newest iPhone has uh, LiDAR in it and the iPads have LiDAR in it which is targeted for contractors to scan a room, but it works totally fine if you wanna scan your friend's head. So you can absolutely 3D scan with your iPad Pro or your, your newest iPad and iPhone. It is 100% a feature that's built in. And Apple is sort of assuming that we're gonna to get to a point where many people want that as VR becomes more and more common. So they just wanted to have it as a feature. Um, is it called on the iPad? I don't know what it's called on the iPad because I don't have an iPhone. Uh, but it, it's totally 
there's got to be a thing i can find it and put it in slack um it looks like yeah you could you can google it absolutely um there is also a Xbox Connect downstairs that's really good at this. So we have like a little turntable and an Xbox Connect. So you can do it with that. Um, Mesh Mixer, the software that I've talked about but not pulled up. I don't have it installed on this laptop, but let's let's um, control T. Mesh Mixer is good at this. If you're really interested in it, I would definitely go in and get Mesh Mixer because it can do photogrammetry where you take and install it's just got to downloads right so here it is you can download mesh mixer and you've got a windows installer and it knows that i've got a windows computer so here's you can do this and play around with mesh mixer it has photogrammetry stuff done by a full real computer not a phone which is probably going to be better in the long run anyways um my friend who does this assures me that it goes best if you have a uniform background so if you can take your model and set it on a large white sheet of paper and then take pictures from different sides, have your friends sit in, in sort of a counter color room, like a green, a fully green room, or like in this weird void <laughs> that our classroom is, come up here and do the scan in here. This would work great. Uh, also, even lighting really helps. And so that's something, I mean, Google has figured it out without even lighting, but for most scanners, even lighting really makes it better. But it's a great process. If, if this process, if you wanna go even deeper in, you can do structured light scanning. And these are interesting scanners that are both projector and scanner. And so they project on stripes of light. So you can see these sort of stripes here on this uh, butterfly. And those stripes, because it's expecting a certain specific geometry from the stripes, when it takes the, the adjoining photo, it's looking for the stripes that it expects to see and sees where they're different. So not only does it get just like sort of edge finding, it can also look at the shape along the geometry that aren't just the outside edges of the piece. And so you can get better detail for thing for kind of flat surfaces works really well. Here's scanning um, for a military purpose, I guess. Here's some other nice things. We don't, as far as I know, we don't have one of these, although I know that we have a nicer scanner than the Kinect. I just don't know what it, what it's about. I don't know, but um, this is one of the turntables. We do have a turntable down there and that's super nice if you wanted to do some scanning, that way it turns on its own and you don't have to worry about it. One of the things you gotta be careful about with the phone apps, because they also have the angle motion tilt thing in your phone, it might be looking for that as a second input for position. So that may, it works well with the connect, but it may not work well with the phone. So it's a little tricky. If you really wanna get into this, you can definitely figure out how to do it really nicely with, with your right setup. Um, and then here's the LiDAR scanning. So this is the actual output from the iPad Pro. And Canvas, uh, found, Canvas is the thing. Self-driving vehicles are also have LiDAR on them. So if you have a Tesla or a friend with a Tesla, the LiDAR is looking all the time for what's going on around you. It's sending out laser inf light information and then looking for the pulses to come back. It's super high fidelity. You're talking about like nanometers sort of accuracy if everything's firing on all cylinders. Um, but we need to get our clock speeds up really high for that to work. But the, another thing that's really cool is here's a thing that we found in the Amazon jungle with flyovers where they were shooting LIDAR down in between the trees and they could see sort of the ground topology through the trees with LIDAR. And so they found a hidden ancient city that no one knew was there or, or you know, none of the people doing research knew was there. And so there's some really cool things that this can be done with. This is like the highest level stuff, but the iPad Pro is really cool because it's brought it into sort of modern uh, accessibility. And the iPad, because it's an Apple product, is really good at integrating it so that it looks really nice just like out of the box without as many technical challenges as other solutions. Um, but I think you can actually go look at that. Here's, you know, if we, here's the scanning process. You can see it sort of, going through and scanning the room in that moment, which is which is pretty cool. And I don't normally like to call out individual apps, but boy, that is a fun trick. And so they're, there they're getting a quick, you can imagine a contractor walking into a kitchen and like normally they'd need to spend a lot of time measuring and looking at things and doing all that. The fact that they can walk in, wave around an iPad and then walk out and then they can measure all the stuff later is is kind of mind blowing. So it's a really cool process. 
if you want to get into that. Um, and it's it's accessible with you know without a huge cup. It's really pretty doable. So let's say you 3D modeled something or you have 3D printed, 3D scanned something. That's a cool way to make things on a 3D printer. And so 3D printers are really great for that. But one of my personal favorite ways to make things is two and a half D construction, which is a silly, it's a silly name. Um, it, essentially 3D things from 2D parts. And so that's how most, like most of your woodworking projects have always been. Boards are roughly two-ish D. And so you're gonna use 2D parts to build 3D things. And so the easiest, quickest way is to do Slicer for Fusion 360. And so there's this, this software that I have pulled up. We're gonna take, I'm gonna do it live in front of all of you and hope and cross my fingers that it works. Um, so here's, we're gonna look at other examples. This is a, a stool that would be good two and a half deconstruction. We'll look at that in a second. Um, here's the dust shoe for the Gerber that I designed and made out of two and a half deconstruction. And then here's some weird shape. We're just going to use this weird shape. I'm going to download this and save as a mesh. So if you ever want to 3D print something out of Fusion 360, this is what you want to do. I have it set so I can always see my triangle preview. So you can see all the weird triangles going on in there. And I'm going to download it as an STL. And I'm just going to do this and save it to my desktop. And we'll call this test one. Nice and big so I can read it from here. Cool. And then we'll pop back over to Slicer. And this, the interface for this is like tragically bad. It's very, very small. And so if we go to not downloads, but here and then desktop. And hmm, where did I just put it? Oh boy. Let's try this again. Save as mesh, STL, binary, inch, okay. And, oh, it's inside of a thing. We'll just put it onto regular desktop. There we go. There it is. Okay, so here's the shape brought in as an STL. And so you can see that it's there. This is for Slicer for Fusion 360 or Slicer sort of independent of that. What you can do is choose a process that you want to make it. And so you can make it with a whole bunch of stacked slices like this. So it takes that 3D model and turns it into a whole bunch of sheets that you'd cut, right? And so this is sort of a silly thing. My size is way off base, but I'm gonna leave it this size just to not fiddle with the details. You can change like your angle that this happens at. So you can change what that looks like over here if you wanted a particular vibe. Like if you really wanted them to be all angled, it's really fun. Um, you can also do, let's see, there's other, here's a format where you have like pieces that slot together. Let's change our slice angle for this also. We'll head back up to straight up. If it'll let me, yeah. Um, and in general, it's not super happy with the design right now. Any of these that turn red over here, it thinks are, are broken in one way or another. Or like this one looks pretty delicate down over here. It's probably cranky with me about that. Or that this, that sort of middle piece would fall apart where it wants to build the geometry, but it's saying like, this is sort of on the border of what's allowed. Um, you can get those different things, but there's a ton of different processes that you can use to make these. It's pretty happy with that which is kind of a fun thing. You, could, you can imagine sort of fun shapes popping out of here. And this is just like an abstract geometry, right? There's nothing particularly useful about this um, other than it's just fun, but there's, you can imagine sort of really, here's an origami method, which is really cool or cut paper. So this is a bunch of paper cut designs. You can imagine making something on the laser, laser cutting out this design and then just assembling it from there. What well, would be really cool and it doesn't, this doesn't do it well, but a software called Pepecura does, where it'll take a 3D model and not only give you the cut lines, but also print an image on it so that you can print out on printer paper, print out a picture in this weird shape. And then when you assemble it, it looks like a TIE fighter or it looks like a Bulbasaur or whatever you wanted to make. Um, so there's some really cool options for how you'd slice, but this is a fun way to make things out of just flat materials. So. It's a, a really cool process. Um, this software, 
that I think they just want to have be integrated into Fusion 360, but it never successfully finished. Um, so it's worth it to download and install and play around with if you're, it, it was an extension. So on a previous computer, I had up here, there's the make, there's the tools tab. I had it so that it lived over here as one of these in the toolbar. Um, and well, it was its own program first, then it was installed into Fusion 360 and now it's kind of uninstalled into Fusion 360 somehow. So maybe they're trying to circle it back. It's unclear to me. It's probably a separate product that they now want you to sign up for would be my guess. Um, but those are, those are all different things. There is a 3D print utility inside of Fusion 360. I've never used it. I don't know if I would, I can't recommend just out of sheer non-experience. Um, but it's really cool. There's other, other models that work really well for this. One of the things that I have pulled up is here's a bench for Slicer. And so here's sort of a weird funky curved bench. And this plays really nicely in Slicer. So if we take this one and download it, uh, save it as a mesh like this, plop it into the desktop. We'll just say that that is a uh, bench like that. And then pop back over to here. We should be able to, don't wanna save that. Let's do the bench. Here's this, and I'm a big fan. This is where I think the stack slices can, can look really cool. You can even do stack slices along like a curve. If we choose our flow direction to be just right, you can, you can make some interesting things. So like here's a, that is a structurally sound bench made from that weird 3D model. And it's just a bunch of slats that you'd cut and then sort of fit together. So if these were sheets of plywood, you'd use three sheets of plywood and have a bench with a, with a weird funky volume. You can imagine this getting very strange or very like a uh, couture kind of furniture if you really wanted to go into it. So there's all sorts of, this is a really neat software to be able to use. And I definitely want you to get a chance to try it out if you're, if you're interested. Um, another thing that's really neat is to make it out of stacked cardboard because cardboard has its own internal texture. So you can make really cool things. I saw an awesome, awesome, awesome chandelier like thing that was the world. And then they had it made out of cardboard. So light came really well out of two sides, but not so well out of the other sides because it was a hollow globe. It, it was a really cool piece. Um, but so that is done for you. Like that's the software that takes care of all of that stuff without you doing the details of it. DXFs are the way that you do it manually. And so if you wanna make something, you're gonna need to get to DXFs, which is digital exchange files. So that if you have a geometry that you wanna make for real out of a 3D modeling software, this is probably gonna be your intermediary. And so DXFs like this are file formats that come out of sketches in Fusion 360. In SolidWorks, I think it has its own like click on a face and export the face as a DXF. In Tinkercad, I know they can export DF DXFs. So if you design everything in Tinkercad, you can totally export these from there. Um, it's a little different, but in Fusion 360, you make a sketch. Usually I'll make the sketch at the very end once I'm happy with the design, and then you can export that as its own separate thing. And so from there, you get access to all sorts of different building processes. So these are all things that I have made using that process where the cello, I made this with kids. A lot of these I made with kids. Um, the cello we designed in Fusion 360, and then we exported the DXFs from its face. And then here's stools, like we're gonna take a look at in a minute. And then this table was all 3D modeled and then export each one of the faces as a DXF. And then in here for this like cart and the laser cut cardboard thing, I'm modeling in the thickness of the material. But when I do that, I get to pull out all the DXF faces and then I can, I can sort of realistically make sense of what that material is gonna look like and fit together as. So there's interesting, pieces for how this works. Um, and so let's pop over to some examples to see to see what this look like, looks like. Uh, like here's the flat pack stool. This one we had talked about. And so in here, I can go in and like hide away some of the, the bodies. Like if we hide away one of the legs and the top, you can imagine this being cut out of a, just a single sheet of plywood. The color of the wood is pretty not useful. It's just so I can tell the three pieces three pieces apart. 
Um, but this would be able to be cut out of just one piece. It's got a couple of weird features like these little bites in it. Those are dog bones. We'll go over this when we talk about CNC, but those are dog bones. A CNC end mill is always a round cutting tool. And so if I want a square peg to fit into a round hole, I need it to, I, I need one of the two things to, I need them both to be square in the end. And so uh, what I'll need to do is if I had this like tall vertical slot and I just let the router come up and cut away and go, I would never quite get this corner fully cut. The detail would never quite be there. And so overcutting it just a little bit doesn't really affect the structural integrity at all. But what it gives me is a spot where that piece that is square can come slot right in. And so then I have the ability to make these fit perfectly. Um, and you can certainly finish up any of these cuts with like a chisel and something by hand. Um, and some people would absolutely do that because they think it looks nicer or even just take these and flip them to this side where they're probably going to be hidden. So that works as well. Um, some people would totally move those around. Some people will even cut them by hand at the end so that it fits. I'm a big fan of it's on the robot. The robot's doing the cutting. Just let the robot finish the cutting. Uh, and so it's, it's really fueled by laziness, but those dog bones work. And so you've got this flat piece. And then if we switch up what leg we're looking at, there's the matching flat piece. So you can see that those two sort of fit together with that slot right there in the middle, both cut flat from flat pieces. And then the top just lays on top of those two and it needs to have dog bones in its corners also. You don't need it on this inside corner because the, the round end mill can just ride that corner edge. It goes really slow, but it can totally cut an interior. It can, it can cut an external corner, but not an internal corner. And so it affects your design in certain very specific ways. Um, these I added in by hand. If we go through sort of the animation process of how this was made, this can be super helpful to really understand how designs work. The timeline here is just gonna roll through as it goes. So you can see I'm sort of drawing and one at a time I'm adding in features. I'm gonna play it again and talk. Uh, but I did a sketch, then extrude. There's a conflict that then we solve and sort of move through the process of building this. Usually what I'll do is draw in what it looks like, do any combination tools to make sure that the slots show up the way that I want them to. And then once I get it to a point where like here, everything's good, but you can see there's no dog bones. I, I sort of design what I want first, and then I go in and I add in all the dog bones and all those features. You can see even I added a little gap. I usually do that with something like this where the material thickness is a feature that you're thinking about because plywood is never perfectly the size you think it is. So I add like two hundredths extra space so that those will slot together. Because when I'm making a stool like this, I'm usually making it so that I can have it in the back corner of a classroom, pop it together if I need it, tear it apart if I don't, and it's really easy to have and, and not have. And so those sorts of things I add in at the end. And then down here at the bottom of the model, sort of the last three things are, here are the sketches that are the DXFs I'm gonna export. So if I wanted that, I'd come into sketches and I can right click on these and save these sketches as DXFs. So that's the process that you'd use to export and go from there. Um, from that point, you can use any number of software to make things. But what I'm gonna pull up is vCarve and we're sort of wandering into making it on a CNC territory and I'm just a little bit rambling. Um, but vCarve is this software that will let you make things. There's definitely, they've been running vCarve classes which I'm super excited to see. Um, because it's, it's a full-fledged making software, but it's for CNC. It's a little bit wonky, uh, but in here, this is just to make things on the Gerber. And so like today downstairs, um, Ruby is cutting things on the Gerber, but if we have a file like this, let's, let's come in here and I'm gonna actually save this DXF. If we have this file, throw it on the desktop and we'll do uh, stool, probably spelled wrong because I can't see it. And then over here, we can go to file, import vectors. And then from here, yeah, definitely spelled wrong, there's the stool. And so if this were a full sheet of plywood, and I think it's 10 inches by 10 inches, I'd be able to take this and cut it out. So this sort of soft, just getting a DXF like this is really helpful. Um, but I can take this exact file. And if I instead wanted to, I can open it up in Inkscape and 
like especially thinking about that bench. Building that bench is going to be expensive to do for three sheets of plywood. I don't even want to know what the cost of three sheets of Baltic birch would be right now. That sounds insane. Um, but if I wanted to model it to be absolutely certain that I love the design, I could open Inkscape and then do the same sort of a procedure where I say file and then import is down here and you can totally import DXFs if I can find it there, just like that. And so it gives me a little pop-up menu and I'm just gonna say, okay. And now it thinks it converts it to an SVG and we're just gonna say, okay. And it comes in at way the wrong size, probably, probably from inches to millimeters is I'm guessing what that was um, because Imperial and metric are hard, but here's my design in Inkscape. And so now if I wanted to laser cut this as a template out of cardboard, I could be very certain that I like the design and that it has all the features. So this is like one leg of the story. You have to do this for each. You have to do this for each one of the faces. Yeah. And so it's a if you want to make a custom design piece like this, it's definitely a little bit more work, but you can make really cool stuff. And so like the and the example that I want to get to eventually is here's the the dust shoe for the Gerber. This was totally designed in Fusion 360. And then these are sheet metal parts. So you're allowed to bend them, which is another layer of weirdness that isn't for right now. But then I could take this, you know, this face, download that entire thing as a DXF and then cut it on the laser, right? And so that becomes possible. If you walk down and take a look at the Gerber, these are the parts that are there. This is, this was cut and the bending information was stored into it. So you could make a flat, a uh, flat panel piece from there that you bend into shape, but this becomes a really useful for a very weird designs sort of skill. And it's something that I had to like model in the size. I would not jump into sheet metal as your first example. The, the stool is a great place to get started. I have a video of me walking through this exact model that I'll, that I'll put on Slack. So if you wanted to make your own stool design, you totally can. Um, but getting an STL can come off of anything. So if you have a model that you like, like if you really like this, you could take that, finish the sketch, and now it's the newest sketch. Usually I'll label these um, DXF and then give it some sort of a meaningful name, like name. And then from there, you can save these and, and start to download. So this becomes useful. That's the core of how all of these things were designed. And, it, and it's tedious, don't get me wrong. Like you, it takes effort and work to do that, but if you're, it's not like it's adding lots onto the work of 3D modeling it, right? That, that's the bulk of the work. And then pulling out those DXFs so that you make them works just fine. So this is, there's the stools, a similar stool cut out of plywood. Here's the table that was one sheet of plywood we needed for our classroom one day. I think this uh, cabinet thing was a sheet and a half. Cardboard works really well. There's all sorts of cool ways to make things with this two and a half D method. It's, it's certainly advanced but it's fun to try. And just to like make yourself a little model of a stool, um, you might call it a stool sample, if you will. Not only is it punny in the worst way, but it's also, um, it's a good way to just sort of check it out and see if this is a process that you're interested in. Because you can make a lot, of, a lot of things in the world are made out of sheet goods. And so starting from a sheet good, now you have a ton of different options on how you'd make things. So, what is, what is the stuff for this week? What are the things that you wanna do? You could download and install Fusion 360 or Onshape if you haven't done that yet. Slicer for Fusion. This is a little strange. I have, at worst comes to worst, I have it saved in my, I have the install file on my Google Drive so they can never take it from me. Um, uh, and so I can share that with you if we need to. Then there's just make a quick geometric shape. So if you're, if, you know, if you're playing around over the next couple of weeks, just build some geometry, right? You could, it would be really fun to take something and laser cut it out of cardboard. So you have some funky thing that you've made. Uh, there is no reason why you'd need to make a stool, but I think it would be fun. One that I'm pretty jazzed about making is that I want to uh, make, and I think I closed it somewhere. If I, maybe it's, no, maybe it's in here. Untitled bench, abstract flower, thinnest dust shoe. Yeah, I closed it for sure. But if we go back to foundations, I was thinking a lot about the Wacom tablet this week. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, okay. All right. Well, it. Uh, I need to upgrade my 
thing. But in, but let's pop back over to here because I have it open in a browser. So inside of, so I built it on my desktop at home, not here. And so here's the Wacom, or wait, yeah, Wacom, whatever you call it. We talked about this earlier. But in uh, 3D model, this is what it looks like broken apart. And this is one of the fun things about looking at these models in the browser is you can break them apart really easily. So here's just like a collection of pieces that it would take to make that. And if I can get that all to fit on a sheet of plywood, that feels like a real big win, right? So it'd be one, one sheet of, and I wouldn't use Baltic birch, I'd probably use sheathing. There's no reason that it needs to be pretty. And in my mind, Baltic birch is a pretty plywood that you use for fine furniture. This is like a, a shop desk, right? It doesn't need to be good. So a $40 sheet of sheathing from Lowe's would be totally fine. Um, and then we'll run this through the Gerber. This is sort of midway through its current design status. You can see there's no dog bones on there, um, but I'm definitely at the point where it's time to add those in. So if I like this model, I would add those in. It's also, um, I wish that I could open it. It's parametric. And so one of the things that was really helpful from talking to Ruby downstairs, who is sort of a graphic artist or is a graphic artist, she wants it to be, I built it for couch height, which is where the Wacom tablet sits right now if you're in the space. But she said, make it desk height. Cause like an artist, like I would sit down and like play on the couch, right? But a person who's genuinely an artist wants it to be at a desk height. And that makes just a lot more sense. Um, so I, since it's parametric, the way that I designed this, I should just be able to type in whatever height Ruby wants it to be and the whole thing will scale. And so, absolutely. Let me go in and take, take a look at a parametric design. So let's make a whole new one. We're gonna do this and I'm just gonna quickly draw a pair. Let's make a parametric thing. So we can just do rectangle like this, hit the rectangle tool. And so here's our rectangle and I'm just gonna plop it down and say finish sketch, which is a very dumb sketch. Uh, but modify and change parameters. So typically what I'll do with a parametric design is I wanna go in and say, here's some user parameters. Like I might want it to be width or, and width might be four inches and this is in inches and say four inches, you can have a comment if you want. And then we'll say height, uh, maybe we'll do depth cause it's still flat. And then we'll do two inches and hit okay. And then I usually like to have code, if I'm building parameters, I tend to want to have a couple of them that I always keep the same for my own sanity. So I usually say mat, which is material thickness. And let's just imagine this is at a three quarter inch plywood, so 0.75. And then the other one that I usually wanna have if I'm gonna do dog bones is bit. And I like these cause they're short names. There's not a lot to them, but there's just enough you don't mix them up. And so the bit that I would use is almost always a quarter inch down cut bit. And so a quarter inch to a quarter and a little and a hair more is usually what I go with. So here's my parameters. And what a parameter means is that I can go in and if I wanna edit this sketch again, I can edit sketch and then this, I'll set a dimension with that tool. All of these have hotkeys by the way, but now I can just say width like that and it sets the width to there. And here is the depth just like that. And so there's that depth. And then let's add in a circle just for fun. And we're gonna say that this is bit for size. And then also super helpful is that you can say things like bit times three. So you can multiply those in like in a semantic sort of way, right? And so that can be really helpful. So we'll finish this sketch and then I'm going to extrude this up and I might wanna extrude it map right? A certain specified distance. So now all these things are sort of built. And then the real power, the real magic sauce of all of this is that now I've got this that's four inches wide for my width, but it's not numbered four inches wide. It's numbered width wide. So if I change it to six, it changes on the fly, right? So in the case of that desk, the way that I have it designed, and it takes a lot of practice to get good at designing something as complicated as that desk for this, but now when Ruby says she wants it to be 24, 28 inches tall, I can type in 20 inches, 28 inches and it just boom, smacks right up. So those sorts of details, you have to think a lot about constraints and relationships and how do you do that? That's an elegant high level modeling. Don't 
do that at your beginning and Tinkercad can't do this, but it's really fun to play around with. What's up? So you're saying it's put in the 28 instance in this menu, everything else will scale with it? Uh, no, that's a good question. In this model, which is way more complicated, I set up the relationship. So like the height of these walls, I actually designed in the top and the bottom first. And what I did when I did that is I set their separation to be desk height, like the value called desk height. And then when I designed in these walls, I did not draw them in. Um, I drew them in from captured geometry from the top and bottom shelf. So if the top and bottom shelf move, the walls will stretch along with it, including the curve. And so all of that stuff, is it takes many layers of getting better at it for that to work and not break. And absolutely, one of the processes that I do to make sure that it's going to work when Ruby gives me a number is that beforehand I've tried it and made it break <laughs> to see like how, how does it not work when you want it to not work? Because it's like two minutes of playing around at the computer, right? Like a little bit of playing around to get that to work so that when you need it to, when you're with a client, let's say, and they say, no, it needs to be an inch and a half taller, you can do that. Another thing that's really helpful for parametric designs, and this is super duper practical, is that when you buy your sheet of plywood, it's almost never 75 hundredths on the nose, right? So this could be 0 0.725, and now the thing changes, right? And if it's designed super well, and all those little tabs that were supposed to fit together are perfect, then you can change that parameter and all the tabs will fit with your real material. It's definitely, this is, I want to say out loud and very, very clearly, I have been 3D modeling since I was in early college. It is a very long acquired skill. You're not going to just like pick it up and in three weeks get to this point, but it's definitely doable as a skill set that you can build. And then once your models get to something close to this, you'll really enjoy it. Parameters are in, there's a couple ways to get to them, but I go to modify and parameters. And so they're right here. And actually probably what I should do is put pin mine to the toolbar. I use them a lot, but then they're up here. So you can now add in, and then there's different. Another thing that's useful is that there are these sketch parameters. So every single distance in Fusion 360 gets a name. And so there's some things that I did not name, or if I wanted something to exactly match this, I could now call it D3, right? So let's say I wanna add another hole add a sketch onto here. I wanna add another hole. And instead of calling it bit times three, I can call that D3. And you can have relationships D3, nope, D, was it D8? Oh yeah, I can't see from, okay, thanks. But there it is, D8. And so there's the D8 just for it to fit. And so we can finish that sketch and do extrusions of any type that you want. Like we could extrude this down uh, let's not do the big one, just that one. Just close you, select that. And maybe we wanna do negative mat divided by two. A lot of these sort of semantic relationships and dimensions can be really, really powerful. It's a good next level addition to your 3D modeling skills, but it is not a beginner move. So if you've already played around in 3D modeling software this week, and this was not your first week doing it, then start to think about these and constraints. Uh, par parameters and constraints kind of have to come together hand in hand because normally if I want to set up dimension like this, I'll also want to do something like, uh, I'll probably want to say, oh, I probably did a different thing, edit sketch. I'll probably want to do something like this hole should be directly up against this hole and the the, bottom. So I, I might want to add in other parameters that sort of say where it should live, right? I could also add in dimensions that say it should be exactly one inch in from this side or one inch in from that side with sort of lines. So if I undo that and put it back, another way that's useful to play around with this is I could add a line here and add a line, well, maybe here because I can see it. And then these lines if you click them and hit X, they turn into construction lines, so they don't interfere with anything. But then you can set that dimension if you wanted to also. So I could say exactly how far away from those edges you'd want to have it be. So all of those design features are very doable. There, there's lots of little tricks. It's definitely something that watching 
a bunch of online videos of people modeling things really actually helps a lot. Or if you have a chance to design um, 400 strange little things with high schoolers, it works really well also. So either of those strategies to get better at this, totally workable, um, but play around and see what you want to have happen so that you can, you can build as complicated of designs as you want. Eventually you can get way further into it. We're gonna do most of our designs this week. The best thing that I would say to do is to take your designs and then play around with them this way. Uh, I think that that is supposed to be, if I lock in our dimensions, I think it's supposed to be 16 inches tall in reality. So here's like our, our table brought out to real size. But the big thing that you'll want to do if you wanted to make something for real. So if let's say you have some design like the like the stool that you wanted to make for real, what I'd need to do is scale it so that it matches the thickness of the material that's there. So this was designed for three quarter inch material. And if it's going in for um, if it's going in to be made out of cardboard that's only at 1.15 inches thick, then I'll need to convert this down to like. 20% of its original size, doing some math to scale it appropriately. But if you build it the right size, you can test the whole design out of cardboard before you build it out of wood, which is, which is a worthwhile process if you really intend to lean into this hard for building furniture. And there's definitely people that have. Um, while, we're, while we're able to, let me pop over. Another thing that's good to look at for this just for inspiration is open desk. And so OpenDesk is this software or this, this um, design firm that all of, their, all of their furniture, you can download design files for. So this is all designed in that way. And in theory, they, and I'm not sure the status of this company right now, but there's a download button. You can have it made, like you can have this desk made for you for that much. I'm pretty sure that most of their construction sites are in Europe. So Fab Labs in Europe that will download these and make them for you. Um, but in theory, you could download the digital fabrication files. I'm going to click on this, and it's going to tell me that their servers are temporarily down. Um, but what you're going to get is a file like this. So that here's the layout of that desk all for one sheet of plywood. And then you just cut it out on the CNC. And so this is very much that 3D design process to a two and a half D construction method that works really well. And so this is a little, a slightly different version of our Gerber downstairs. So if this is something that you're interested in, learning how to 3D design in this specific way can be really empowering when we get to the CNC weeks. And we're, and we're gonna talk about this a lot more. But um, the big things for this week, if we're popping back over to what are your actual goals now that I've sort of wandered into all sorts of different topics are to, I would say a big thing would be to continue on with 3D printing things. If you haven't 3D printed something yet, I would definitely try 3D printing something. And then the other thing that I would really love for you to do is to make your own unique 3D model design. It doesn't have to be complicated, doesn't have to be a lot, doesn't have to be parametric, but it could be something. Uh, that stool is a good example. If you, wanted to, if you wanted to model something and make it with slicer, you can totally do that. Or if you wanted to make something like this, you totally can. The stool, I have a video walking you through step-by-step step and showing the clicks. I'll post that so that you can follow along. It is a parametric design with constraints. So you can start to see what that looks like if you wanna watch me walk through it. And I'm happy to help anybody walk through these things also, because they're lots of fun. Um, the doghouse, if you built that this past week, the doghouse is not really makeable. It's maybe 3D printable, but it's not makeable because those aren't, it's, it's imagining it as all one interconnected piece of wood, right? So it's not really all sorts of fun ways to make things. They don't have to be made in the same way. So those are some of the cool processes that are really um, interesting to try and to look at. I want you to definitely give this a shot to keep playing with those things. It's important that I say, let me stop the share so that the camera is nice and big. Um, but importantly, this week is a bunch of holidays. And so my schedule, I want to share with you all, I'm going to be around and pretty busy packing and wrapping all those cutting boards between now and Thursday. And then on the 23rd, I've, I've taken a personal day and I'm going to drive the 11 and a half hours to Ann Arbor, Michigan. And so 
it's going to be delightful. Uh, but then I'll be back right on New Year's Eve. And so I'm going to have the very first ever New Year's Eve with my wife. She's a doctor. They're very busy people. <laughs> um, and so we're going to have New Year's Eve. And then um, I'll be back in town. So starting the first, I'll be back. And next week is sort of when the Monday comes and goes. It'll be right after Christmas, before New Year's. And so that is a time when we figured it would be good to have a wild card week. So if you want to come in and build, up, I would say up until the 24th, this place gets busier, busier, busier. And then everybody is sort of late giving their gifts after that point. And then it kind of turns into a ghost town is my one year's experience of having been here during, during the holidays. Um, so starting on the 25th, this place is still open, but it, it is very, very quiet if you wanted to make things in, in silence and solitude. Does that bear out your experience, Stephen? Yeah, <laughs> everybody's frantically making right up until the end. Yeah, frenzied to empty. Oh yeah, Boxing Day, you're in. Totally a good day to come. Who's like, Oh, I want to look at the, what what day of the week is. Oh, Christmas is a Saturday. So the 20, yeah, family, family holidays that still happen on the 26th. I wouldn't be shocked if there's somebody in on the 25th doing the last sanding of a cutting board they're given to somebody on the 26th. But um, you know, that's that's a little it's a little dicey. Hopefully that's none of us. So uh yeah, that is that's my tentative plan. But now is the exciting time to get to hear what you guys were up to this week. And it can be anything. It doesn't have to have been 3D modeling. It would be neat if it was. Uh, but there's a lot of cool stuff that all of you have done in different ways and times. And so let's see. We've got some people who are in the room and some people who are remote. And nobody who's remote has their camera on. So let's start with people in the room. Sounds like fun. And so what? I think is going to be best is if we have you come over here to this microphone. If you need help with uh, any of this, I'm certainly happy to. So anybody want to volunteer to go first? Okay, great. So I did try to model something on Fusion 360, but I forgot my laptop and I haven't published to my uh, web page yet. So uh, what I modeled was a stand for the project that I'm working on for my dad, um, which is these uh, acrylic LED like uh, Here, I'll things. Hold your talk. Yeah. So I have two versions of it. I'm talking in background so that you can see. Um, so when Oh yeah, I could do that. Yes, that's a good. Sure. That works. Um, and so there's a big version and a little version. I'm just gonna give both of them to him. Um, so, uh, this little one. That's the little one. That's great. I actually don't know if it's backwards. I don't know if Zoom mirrors my image or not, but those look great. <laughs> I, it turned out really well. The, I've got to get a like a magic eraser or something to get the rest oh. of that smoky burn stuff off. Yeah. But it, it comes off with my fingernail, so I think it's not going to be very hard to get. Um, and then I got some LED lights on Adafruit and did my first at-home solder job, and it works. Uh, I don't have a video of the lights going, but. Uh, it works. It turns on, the lights show up, and it looks really cool on the bottom of the acrylic. Um, so that was that. And then I planned on Fusion 360 the model, but then whenever I got it and actually started cutting wood for it, I uh, scrapped those plans and I'm going a different <laughs> direction. But for the 3D printing, um, printed, here's a little video of it actually printing a headphones like holder um, for my fiance who hangs his headphones all over <laughs> the apartment. Um, so there it is. Now his headphones have a place to live. And we ran out of filament actually towards the end, but there was enough for the headphones to hang out and you can see the inside of it. So you can see the infill 
and I think it looks cool. So anyway, awesome, great. Thank you. That was a that was a lot this week. All right, Arvia or Lisa. Sure. Or... I'll have hold things. Do you mind if I just hold this up? Yeah. Oh, I was going <laughs> to illuminate it. Oh, we can do that too. Yeah. So, Elizabeth, right? Oh, look at that. It's even coming through. How cool is that? Yeah. Or, I bet cool. if I put it right in front of the light. Like if I take this away, does it? Does it's still, it still sort of gets it. Yeah, that's wild. Okay, so this has been pointed at the camera the whole time, ready for the turn. Boom, there it is. Super thin. Yeah, oh yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, so that was fun. I was um, printing two things simultaneously um, because I had some challenges with the, uh, let's see with this item here. Yeah. Um, you know, you, I, everybody was doing octopi and I decided, well, I'll try another articulated thing. So I chose this monkey. And um, I we found out I had to put a, what is it, a skirt or a brim? We had to put a brim on it in order for the printer to succeed in really laying down enough of every piece. Um, and it came off easily. So, when that was finally printing successfully, I then went on to the lithophane, yeah. which um, I wanted to do so that I could get experience with it. And then I want to make a, a, a different one that would be a nightlight. So I have the file and I would have loved to send it to the printer, but I need white filament and there really isn't enough anymore. Yeah, that makes sense. So I, either I'll buy, I think I'll have to buy some, just yeah. so no, they're thinking of ordering it, but. Uh, I think it's on the order list, but yeah. One thing that's wild and worth commenting on on lithophanes yeah. yeah. is that the dark spots are definitely the thickest, and that, and that probably makes sense in a lot of ways. But it's kind of counterintuitive that like the parts that are the darkest get the the most height. It looks well. It makes sense to me. So less light goes through. It makes sense. Something about it feels backwards to me every time I see one and the lights are off. Yeah, so I'm I'm going to be really mystified to finally do the other one because this was a given, whereas the one that I'm going to do for the nightlight, I uh, use my own image instead. Oh, that'd be cool. So we'll see. I mean, it's not me; it's an image I made. <laughs> and uh, so then I just wanted to bring this back in that I decided I wanted to stain the box, and I did a lot of research. I didn't want to have to go out and buy all kinds of heavy duty stains and tints. I wanted to dye this thing. And so, like I told you, I, I discovered a, um, a post where you could use food coloring in white vinegar. And so it's like as if you're gonna dye an Easter egg, so to speak, because this is a natural material. And it, uh, it took a little bit to figure out how to take that turquoise food dye and make it dark blue by adding some red to it. And um, it, it, it just went really well. And then, um, then I, uh, I've been, I sanded it a bunch of times and I put on polyurethane and so that's that. And then I, on the inside, the original image that the top uh, comes from is there, so. That's great. Uh, and then lastly, I wanted to, you know this, I went and did one of the um, fabric final cut cutter things. and stuck that on there but as it turns out i've got to put it in the press again that's not really fully on there no i know it really isn't it's not like baked into it so oh. yeah i would see i it was too hot for me to put away and too heavy so i and i realized i didn't tell you mm -hmm. but so it's still there okay and then it's caught okay all right so that's that's my deal all right are you know what you've been up to? Right, well, you, you just did something. Okay, boy. Um, you want to talk to the microphone? We'll just pop it over. Um, yeah, I wasn't able to get badge this week, so I am getting badge tomorrow on the 3D printer. Um, I started a cutting board, finally, um, another one out of some strips of maple 
Walna and Sapele. Sapele. Um, so yeah, that is what I did this week. That's cute. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the cutting board's glued up downstairs right now. It's I'm real excited to see how it comes out. It ought to be a nice one. Awesome. All right. And then we have our three remote people. So James or Yushi or Norm. James, your camera's on. You good to share? Uh yeah. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? Yes, yes we can. Cool. Uh, so first of all, I finished another one of these cherry cutting boards, which is like 12 by 17. Um, and it came out awesome. It's for a friend of mine for Christmas. Um, and then I got the COVID booster and slept for like four days. So didn't get badged on anything. But I have here with me a tarantula enclosure where you can't see the tarantula, but it's basically slotted together uh, laser cut acrylic from the manufacturer. And I want to build something. So I want to design and build something similar uh, that's better. Uh, there's things that I really don't like about this enclosure. I talked to Steven about it a little bit already. So I'm really excited to get to the point where I can make what I want uh, happen with, with that. I also have a couple woodshop projects in mind that um, the the whole idea of the the constraints is really cool. You, in my head, I feel like I can uh, design something the way I want it, and then square lumber. Right? I can get rough cut lumber and square it, and be like, it's this thick. This is the material thickness. Here's all the cuts I need to make to make it come out the way I want, and I don't need to do that math. Um, so I just kind of want to play with that and figure it out. Right. Um, and as a bonus, I have a tarantula that's semi-visible, if anyone cares. That's, that's a real fun. <laughs> so yeah, that's it. Uh, I basically slept for four days and thought about this, and, you know, lo logged in and, and here I am. That's all I have. <laughs> so cool. cool. Where'd you, where'd you get the cherry wood? Oh, where, uh, Lisa wants to know where you got the cherry wood. The cherry was a, a board that was in the hardwood uh, store in the back of Makehaven. And oh. the so Adam Adam thinks that it came from City Bench before he worked there. Um, Got it. It may be from New Haven somewhere, but there's a bunch of oak back there that I have a couple things that I, I want to work with, um, but I want to design the thing and then get the oak to where it's square on four sides. And I don't want to square it before I design it, right? Yeah, it's that's tricky, especially if you're, there's a whole, the dynamic between designing and squaring is hard. Like right. when we were making Ar Arvia's board, her cutting board, we started priming that up. We cut it into 18 inch long, 19 inch long strips because they're easier to square when they're shorter. Uh, and then we made them square from that. But it's if you, when you do your squaring, it may not be the thickness that it was. It, it's not the thickness it was at the start. Right. So, so this, this was six feet long, and I squared four sides, all six feet, and yeah. then cut it into pieces, and then cut it into pieces, and then edge grained it and glued it so that it was all one thickness when I glued it together, which, um, it, you know, that's a different yeah. way. <laughs> but you it totally lose, is. You lose a bunch of material doing it that way. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. There's different for um, the strategy that we were using this afternoon was to cut them and then use the planer with all the pieces go through at the same time. So you get one flat face and then the planer makes them all the same, even though they're done in separate pieces. So it's it's like a six a half, a six a one half dozen to the other yeah. kind of situation. But yeah. um definitely parameters can help if you're like all of a sudden you've planed down your board to flat and now you need to change the material size you can yeah. totally do that yeah i, I want to make like a like a buck saw right i don't know if oh. you if you know what a buck saw is like a i think so two yeah. pieces 
with a central piece and a saw blade at the bottom and then yeah a, a, a piece of cord to tighten it so yep. all of the parameters need to basically be made to what the saw blade is so et cetera, et cetera. I'm rambling. Sorry. <laughs> oh, you're good. That that sounds like fun. A good challenge. Yeah. I like I like that specifically that's a reasonable scope for like it's not a very complicated project for a first one. The constraints that you're talking about aren't like gonna be a lot of constraints. So it's right. it's a good place to get started. Right. Yeah. Just basically the final shape of the wood is gonna determine how it all works. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thank you. Let's see. We've got Yusha. You're next up on the list. If you if you want to share what you've been up to, I'm sure uh, you've yeah. been doing cool things. So um, nothing cool. <laughs> Just finished my finals, and uh, that's uh, uh, I feel great about that. So I have a little more time to do my own things now. Um, so I guess like. Because I totally missed out so much, so I'm just going to spend um, the next few days to catch up with the previous videos, and then also cool. um, uh, I think I um, so I, I I definitely want to fix my uh, liar case. Um, it's been lying in the in the back for a long time at Make Haven. Um, so I want I want to find a way to uh, figure that one out. Either I make a piece to like as a patch to put on it, or um, maybe when you come back, uh, you can help me to take a look at if we can actually make a new case, like a, just a, a new one. Those those are all possibilities. There's a ton of great value in that case, and I think probably we can find a way to patch it so that it's got the pieces that you need. Even if we rivet on like a, a little piece of sheet metal to hold it stable and then put a foot onto there. There's a ton of ways that we can that we can make that a cool solution for you. Yeah. Um, but it would also be fun to model a new one if you wanted to go way down. That's a that's a deep rabbit <laughs> hole is my like first thought. It would be a lot. Yeah. That's going really to be a cool. lot. Um, I'm just going to spend some time to uh, uh, get the ba uh, the, uh, the the badges, and um, yeah. there's going to be a ton of videos I need to watch. <laughs> yep. Yeah, you, uh, you'll be busy over the next couple of weeks, I'm sure. The if I were you, I think the fun, achievable ones, given where you were, I would focus on getting the laser badge. Hmm. You can make a ton of cool stuff on the laser. The vinyl cutter would be a good addition because it's relatively quick, also, hmm. and then the 3D printers are a great place to hop in because you can make a ton of weird stuff with those three tools if you needed to prioritize what are three badges to go after. I'd right. probably do them, yeah, laser, 3D printer, final cutter, maybe in that order. Okay, yeah. cool, thank you. No problem, awesome. And Norm, what? how are you doing? Let's see. Hi. Am I? Yeah. Okay. I'm okay now. And yep. um, sorry. No, you're good. You're good. Normally you like to share. So I just turned it on so you could share your screen if you want. Oh, to. excellent. Okay. Right. Yeah. Let me, uh, let me do that. Um, yeah. So I decided I would make a speedboat and um, of the kind that you put in an Italian lake. Can you see it? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So it launched really well. It, uh, no, I'm just kidding. So I, I, uh, <laughs> I was trying to learn how to, learn how to um, use Fusion 360. It does really cool kind of uh, almost clay modeling stuff. And it, and, and it really, you can make things that look very architectural. M more down to earth, I saw that a local uh stained glass artist had some little little pieces and i wondered how you might display them um so simple thing he extruded a polygon to create um a, a display thing that you could mount that kind of stuff on um and then similarly this is a thing called a netsuki which is a, a kimono closure it's made out of ivory it's a very small figurine and um i found that some universities scan parts of their collections and the university a university in new zealand had one where you could download the file and that's a prusa 
model uh, that's an inch and a half tall, which came out pretty well, but I wondered if you could get a better um, resolution using the, uh, 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 the uh, resin printers. And I did a slightly larger version over here with the resin printer um, uh, on the form labs. But I'm, I'm not really sure. It took forever to print the, this one out, um, the, the, the form lab ones. The, uh, the Prusa one was a lot quicker. And if you yep. wanted like a chess piece or something, the feel of, uh, of the, uh, uh, the resin one was much better in your hand. It's solid. This is a tiny bit spongy. It happens to be smaller, but it's, I printed it smaller. Um, but so I was just kind of learning how to use the printers and how to use, use Fusion 360. No, that, that is awesome, Norm. And actually, I think that's a really great assessment of the two printers' outputs next to each other um, because the, the FDM printers, the Prusa, is really good at quick, like, is, I would imagine it's like quick and not really the finished product of anybody ever um, is a good way that I think about those. Whereas the resin printer, like, you can make really nice stuff on the resin printer, um, my sister in Dayton, Ohio, has one specifically to download and print models so that she can hand paint them of her favorite anime characters. And so, like, the resin printer give you gives you that sort of level of detail where that's reasonable to do. Whereas I would never really want to paint or, you know, like, put on a nice shelf the stuff 3D printed from, from the Prusas. They're, they, you know, it's fine. Uh, it actually, the Prusa, the Prusa version of that little man that I printed is fine for display. And I am displaying it next to the, uh, next to the, uh, the one that's similar, that's a real Natsuki. And um, um, so, I, I mean, it's smaller. So some of the, the loss of resolution may be lost in the size, uh, but it works really well. And, and since you aren't picking it up, if you're just looking at it, uh, yeah. it was really fine. The larger one, honestly, for display purposes, isn't a whole lot better. It would be though, but if you wanted to make a chess set, it, that oh. would be a better choice because no, the feel in your hand is more sturdy. Right. Yeah. The and there's no there's like zero visible layer lines, right? Like it's it's just a, it looks like a continuous piece. Well, honestly, the Prusa one. I mean, I I probably used the very slow setting because mm -hmm. even that one took hours to print. Uh, oh so, yeah. You know, so I didn't follow your advice of doing a quick and dirty thing to to get the form out I, I was i was hoping to use it for display anyhow so i wanted high resolution in fact that's that's why i went on to do it in resin also um and i was a little surprised to tell you the truth that the high resolution prusa one didn't look all that different from a distance uh, from from the resin one it's 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 great it's a tactile thing that the, the resin one is a more substantial piece no, that makes sense. I, I suppose probably the number of times I've printed an ultra detail on one of the nice new Prusas is really zero. So it, yeah, I now now I just want to see what the little little, little guy looks like uh, or a set of print and, you know, then go away for the holiday and come back and see what it looks like when it's when I'm back to, to a week later. So uh, awesome. That sounds like a, a fun jump into things. And the, the mesh modeling of the boat was really cool also. So great, great work, everybody across the board. I think it was lots of fun. We're going to have, I think, a, a weird and wonderful two weeks of making things and maybe visiting family that you might not have seen in a while or not, depending on whatever your situation is. But uh, I'll see you around after the new year and I'll be, I'm not running out of here right away. So I can help, but it's good to see you, everybody who's remote. I think we're, we're all done. We're going to button things up and have a happy new year, everybody. Happy new year. Bye. Happy new year.